tonight. I've been asked by the chairperson to say hello to you tonight, but she didn't want to be seen again. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want at the end to be saying, have to say thank you again, but he's probably heard it all week. <laughs> but so, so uh, it's no great, great hardship for me to do so. But welcome anyway to this thing. And the subject is, of course, one that was very familiar to us all growing up. My own first time in the church was this one, well, going to school about a halfpenny. Can we roll it? With a halfpenny, a halfpenny given to the conductors. And we were most upset after I think two years ago that to a penny. <laughs> Old pennies. And then of course my, uh, I live at number nine, eleven I would call the courier lived at number eleven. And he drove uh, Mitchell's buses for a while. And the thing is, the courier was of that generation, he never ever sat a driving test. But he, he did drive a uh, lorries uh, and lorries during the war. But uh, I, I remember the courier driving it and you could have played snooker there. Uh, going in very, very early in the morning. So now I would have to walk to the end of the road, but then I went around the back end. The bus of soap was one of the old ones that you had a clean, had a staff in hand. And uh, I, I still remember how uh, it gave me a shot that you have to be very, very careful in case you jumped back end uh, and to break, break your hand. But anyway, so we all have our little memories of the, of the, of the bus here. Now, I don't, go quite, I don't go quite as far back as the, the heading here, the bus again, the company. But uh, very, uh, very close to it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the person who's doing the talk does go back to that part. But the things, of course, I grew up here in the Epoch, because you have very real, sort of shy, and Milo, and you have a all, all, all these people. Uh, uh, so it's really good, and it's, it's a kind of subject that I think only every day we need. But when we want to be in an election about the bus game. And the conductors, we knew the conductors is also, I'm not going to name them once, I remember just now, in, in case Colin has them, has, them, has them all here, somewhere right, and, and there was, I remember there was one from Tom Stay especially, yes, so she, she was quite, quite the age, the age. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> I, I know, I, I get, I get the, the Tom Stay from the old world, I get, so characters, what you gonna left, and all, 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 all these people, anyway. I've had to put stone and all you've done with Colin. I, I may as well just go now. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, if you haven't come here to listen to me, and I haven't come to listen to me either, uh, on behalf of you all, can I uh, welcome Colin Tucker, well known author uh, of, of all things to do with transport. Most of uh, most, uh, all in relation to tonight is the one who we did about Mitchell's bus. So, Colin, good evening and welcome. Thank you for that kind introduction. Well, kind introduction. <laughs> thank you, Kanyak, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm going to start with two admissions. The first admission is that I am not an expert on buses. Uh, I really don't know the difference between the front and the back of a bus unless it says back on the front of it or something like that. Um, and equally, I have made no claims to being to being an expert on the people of Back District. There are people here who know far more about them than I do. So please, if you hear names that are wrong or you know more about this than I do, please uh, let me know. Just button and uh, you can take over. So this is the story, as I found it, of the buses really the buses that went from back, we should say, rather than the buses that came to back. The first buses came to the island in about the 1920s. That is John Mitchell's second bus, so it never actually came here, but it gives you an idea of what was there in the 1920s. They were called township buses. Uh, they ran from one village into Stornoway. Uh, so this ended up, there were lots of buses then. They ran once a day, really at a time to suit the people, to get them into store and away for their work or their shopping, and leaving again when everybody had completed their business. The word timetable hadn't yet come to Lewis, and even when it did, uh, I don't think it was properly understood for an awful long time. And these buses weren't just for passengers. They would carry all sorts of goods, I could imagine, uh, and probably as uh, I'll mention again, 
sometimes it was difficult to know if it was a bus or if it was a lorry. But it was easy to set up a bus business. All you had to do really was to acquire a bus and run it to Stornoway. Well, not quite all, because you would also have to maintain it and repair it yourself probably. And the latter would have been a very regular task as the roads were so poor that breakages, particularly things like springs, were an almost everyday task. Uh, somebody said that there were in fact no bad roads in Lewis in the 1920s only because there were no good ones to compare them with. So, the first man to set up a bus service in the back area was George Stewart Cheyenne, excuse my Gallic pronunciation again, of 17 back. And that was in 1924. The details of that bus are not known, but in 1927 he was using a Ford TT and registration number, it was, I'm not going to give you the registration number of them all, don't worry. GS2999, so there we are. It had eight seats. Uh, how many were used for passengers and how many for goods will never be known. So this is not his bus, but this is what a Model TT, a Ford TT looked like. You've probably all heard of Model T Fords. Uh, the difference is that this one had a heavier frame and rear axle and was very durable. But the, the description said it was slow compared to similar vehicles. With standard gearing, a speed of not more than 15 miles an hour was recommended. With special gearing, you could reach 22 miles an hour. <laughs> So he got a second bus in uh, 1939, a Bedford. All I could find out was it was painted red and cream and the other thing was a Bedford WS and all the th information about the Bedford WS was that it was a lorry. <laughs> so maybe it was a lorry that carried passengers rather than a bus that carried goods. And then his son George was one of the three that formed the back motor transport in 1947 but more of that later. So this is George Stewart's Bedford. Uh, I have been told that from left to right are Fianley, Mary Jane, Dolina, and George Stewart himself. And if anybody wants to dispute that, please do. So in 1925, second bus appeared on the road, and this was operated by John Murray of Light Hill, who was Ian Evericke Ustjern, and he became another of the back transport trio. <coughs> In 1931, he obtained a stage carriage license to operate a service from back to Stornoway. Now, a stage carriage license, which some of you will, I'm sure, know about, it allows a vehicle to carry passengers along a specific route stopping to pick up or set down passengers at designated stops. And the vehicle had to have seats for at least 11 passengers. So it's interesting, when that Road Traffic Act was introduced in 1931, there were no fewer than 113 other bus operators on the island, all running their township buses into Stornoway. I think as soon as they had to get licenses for them, the numbers dropped down considerably. So this is John Murray's Bedford bus. He obtained that in 1935. And the photo apparently was taken the day that four of those in the photo were leaving for Canada. So from left to right are Nellie Beaton, Toronto, Murdo McLeod, Vancouver, Maggie McGregor, Mrs. K. McLeod, 54 back, Nancy McLeod, Saskatchewan, John Murray and Cathy Murray, who became Mrs. Sandbeck in Vancouver. So that was one of the two buses that he owned. The other one had a bit of a, an odd history. Uh, this is a London bus. Uh, it started life in London where they found it was too small and they put it up for sale. Now, this uh, posed two questions. How did somebody living here find out about buses for sale in London? Uh, and secondly, how did they get it from London to here? Uh, that last second one, did they drive it all the way to Malig or Kyle? Or did they put it on the cargo boat in Glasgow or, or whatever? Interesting how it got here. Uh, 
So that's the, as it was in London, and that's the bus there. Uh, I'll go back to the Road Traffic Act just for a moment. There were certain rules and regulations. There's a 30 mile an hour speed limit for all buses. There was a limit on the hours that the drivers could work without a break. And I just wonder how much any of it was relevant to the drivers from back. Now, uh, after 1931, there was a sudden increase in the number of buses serving back. There were eight new operators, although some of them didn't stay in business for long. There are very few pictures of the buses around about that time, though. Uh, that's the only one I could find, the bus in the background, and in front is apparently uh, the first tractor in back. And somebody suggested that that is Sandy Tooley that's sitting on the, the tractor. Again, I'm just taking people's words for it. So, the new operators, who were they? There was Alec John MacDonald, Alec John Varechi Reynolds, 8 Gress. Uh, he sold his business to Angus Graham, sailor, 41 Gress, in March 1932. Sandy Tooley just mentioned he held a license to run a bus from back. He had two vehicles, both described as lorries, and he lasted till 1935. Norman MacDonald and Torpen from Tongue, he started up in 1931, and then his business became part of the Mitchell Empire in 1937. Kenneth Mackenzie, 44 Coal, ran a service 1931 and 1932. Then there was also John McLeod, Laddie, and Kenneth McLeod, Cunyach, Neil Varant, and they lasted until 1939. And I just wonder whether they stopped because they were called up during the war. There was no information about that. Uh, there was apparently one venture into the bus business by a woman, and she was Annie McLeod of Vatisker. Uh, and nobody's been able to give me any details about her. <coughs> Apparently, she only held a license for about two months, and that's all we know about her. John McKeever, the Peel 15 Upper Call, obtained a license in 1931, and uh, he was one of the ones that uh, became part of the Back Transport Company in 1947. There were two others in Gress, while five buses started running from Tolstoy in 1931. One of the Gress ones was extremely short-lived. Neil Mackay obtained a license in January 1932, but he only ran a service until <laughs> October of the same year. And I remember Dolvob, she told me that he remembers a bus sitting there uh, and he remembers it never moving. <laughs> then there was another Gress resident, Colin Murray, Callan Allen Steam, number 22, uh, and he ran a service in 1935. Other ones were Neil Stewart, Laddie, 50 Vatisker, Kenneth Murray and Boston, 20 Vatisker, and James Murray, 52 Vatisker. Now at this point, I tried to find out if anything had ever appeared in the Gazette. I knew that there was plenty about John Mitchell, but how about the doings of the back area? In fact, there was very little. In 1940, a brief paragraph tells us that being the first Monday of May, it was observed by the younger gentlemen of the back district, particularly by weavers and others engaged in the Harris Tweed industry, as a public holiday. Local buses packed with holiday makers left for various parts of the island. Quite a number went to Ness and North Tolster. <laughs> uh, I think I'm running, I've got. missed out a slide here, have I? There we are, let's go. Just go on to that one there then. Okay. So I suggest that this was one of these occasions when people went to Ness or North Tolster. Uh, and we've managed to recognise in this picture, in the back row from the left hand side, John Murray of Light Hill, Donald Martin, 58 back, Catherine McKenzie, 51 Light Hill, Christine McCritchie, Light Hill, Christina Stewart from back, and Anne McLeod, 66 back. And in front are Catherine Martin, 63 back, Bell Ann Murray, 21 back, William McLeod, 20 back, John Martin, 58 back, 
and Evander Morrison from New Street. Now another bit, wee bit I found out in 1942 there was a really bad winter with lots of snow and at the end of January the back policeman was getting home he got the last bus as far as Laxdale and he started to walk beyond there. At Tongue Corner there was a whole collection of stuck vehicles. There were a cars, a baker's van and a doctor's car stuck behind a bus. So the constable helped to get them clear, the bus being the last one to move. The driver, thinking the policeman was from one of the cars, he drove off and the policeman had to finish his journey to back on foot. <laughs> Later the same year, there was a complaint about overcrowding and poor timing on the school buses. It was claimed the bus from the Nicholson didn't reach back until nearly an hour and a half after the school finished and that it was serious overcrowding. One councillor commented that every bus in Lewis was overcrowded and none of them was being run to a timetable. <laughs> Apparently there were 19 children from back and another 10 from tongue travelling in an 18-seater with adults in the public as well. The quotation was, the bus was crammed to such an extent it would be impossible to put another passenger in it. <laughs> John Murray, the owner, responded two weeks later. He suggested that the school management had, and I quote, no right to jumble facts and fiction together in order to make what might be a slight inconvenience appear as an intolerable grievance. I see the, the educationalists were very good even... No, no, he's not the educational. yes. Anyway, we'll ignore that. He dismissed another claim, that the walk from Gress to back for two pupils was interfering with their educational capabilities by writing that if such a walk is now going to interfere with their education, the marvel is that they were ever able to become secondary pupils for they've been walking almost twice that distance to back school ever since they became of school age. Uh, he went on to say he had always endeavoured to meet the wishes of the travelling public and school managers should be more aware of the problems of running a bus service in wartime. 1944 the Gazette ran a series of articles about life in Tolsta with a couple of references to the bus service. One of them said, by taking a tuppenny fare on the bus, we now turn towards the village. The bus is usually one of the utility type and a 32-seater. It represents a big advance on the gig of 1900. But the other one that I really liked was, when the bus is roaring past, it's always safer to stop your wheelbarrow as the bus eats up two-thirds of the road and barking dogs half of what's left. <laughs> Has anything changed in Tolsta? <laughs> By the time Second World War had ended, the, there were only three operators left. These were John McKeever, who was trading his back motor transport, John and Angus Murray, Milo and George Stewart. And rather than compete against each other, they formed a cooperative business. Initially, under the back transport name and then they changed it to the back transport back Stornoway Transport Limited and they ran buses from Stornoway to back Tongue and Tolsta in opposition with John Mitchell. To begin with they only had John Murray's two buses and the others apparently were still lorries. However they built the fleet up to four with the purchase of some new vehicles, one brand new and one was second hand. So that's the sort of vehicles that they were buying just after the, uh, the Second World War. Uh, I presume most of you recognise where that is then. Uh, and we must assume this is another of the new buses. Uh, the people we have in here are Alec Dan Ulyam Barrant, Morag Alan Futter, Bantrach Dan, Anne Campbell, Mardina Ron Callan, Bantrach Angilali, and Neely Do. And for some reason it seems, is, is it, I wonder, all the photographs are sneak, sneaked around the back of the bus for it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why. Um, I don't, can people name any of these? Because I don't have names for them. That's the ones you just mentioned. That's the ones you just said, I think. No. So are some of them the same as the last picture, maybe then? 
Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, and some of them are posing differently as well. <laughs> Just stop talking in the back row, please. <laughs> so it was, this was the same time that the the garage at back was put in place. So. Uh, that is the view before there was any building there. And if I get this all right, then uh, a disused hangar from Cuddy Point was obtained. So I've got a picture of Cuddy Point, and I'm pretty sure it's not the right hangar, but it's a picture of Cuddy Point with, with some sort of building there that's not there nowadays anyway. It's just to add to the story. <laughs> um, so this is... Uh, in front of the building, and I've got no names for that picture. Whether anyone can put names. Uh, if anyone wants to have a look at it afterwards, anyway, it'll be it'll still be there. There's names on that one, and that's 1950 to 1951. Hard at work in the garage. So, uh, 1947 saw good news and bad news. The good news was the arrival of a new bus. And this, this even got reported in the Gazette, which I think is really good. And, and the, the Gazette reported, we welcome Mr. John McKeever's new bus, which, with its bright red and cream paint, adds a splash of colour to the highways and byways round the district. <laughs> And uh, that is the new bus. And the two are Martina Roll Callan and Jordi Neely Du's brother. Go oh, good, somebody's nodding his head. <laughs> the bad news, though, was that there was now no Tolsta owned bus on the road. And the Gazette noted that Evander McKeever, described as the father of bus drivers, had given up his license with a clean sheet. His service was taken over, surprise, surprise, by John Mitchell. Now, it's impossible to tell the story of Bax buses without mentioning the traffic commissioners. The traffic commissioners would come over two or three times a year to discuss licenses and hear out grievances and sort out any problems. So, as you can imagine, uh, there were some quite interesting and difficult meetings. There was plenty in the Gazette, again, surprise, surprise, about John Mitchell. Uh, but it wasn't till June 1947 I found the first reference to the Back Stornoway Transport Company. The headline read, Back Operators to Run Tours and Excursions. The company had successfully applied to run excursions to Ness, Uig, Lochs, the West Side, Harris, and mystery tours. <laughs> I think we've covered just about everywhere before you went off on the mystery one. Um, and they were leaving from back, church and tongue corner. And John Mitchell eventually withdrew his objection on the understanding that nobody would, picked up, would be picked up in Stornoway, which was presumably where his tours started. Uh, this may not be the exact time, but uh, it gives a, a nice flavour of uh, people going off on an outing. I think that was about 1958. 19? 19? <laughs> Whether anybody recognises? They're all looking very well behaved and very smart. I presume that's the journey going out the way. Very smart with a jacket and tie and the fag in his hand. <laughs> then there was also consider considerable discussion at the meeting regarding the everyday services. This is still 1947. Back Stornoway Transport obtained unopposed a license to run a service from Tongue to Stornoway. It was far from the same when it came to their application for the back service. Angus Murray explained that the three previous operators had combined as they thought they could provide a better service. 
He also mentioned they had a modern ticket system and that the proposed timetable would be almost the same as the one in operation. Then came the opposition from John Mitchell. Although he wasn't there apparently, he even had a solicitor turning up. The objection was against just some of the runs, he said. At 3pm and 10pm from back, and at 12 o'clock, 5.15 and 11pm from Stornoway. I don't know how many others that leaves. Uh, the arguments for these services were that the 3pm from back was necessary for people shopping, and the 10pm for people leaving on the boat, who would otherwise have had to leave at 8 o'clock and spend two hours sitting on the quay watching their luggage. Mr Murray further pressed his case by saying that the 10pm service would enable people to get back to town after an evening round of golf at Col. <laughs> the 12 noon service would let early shoppers home to prepare dinner. The 5.15 would be there to take workers who finished at 5, while the 11pm would enable people to attend the second house at the playhouse. Further evidence in support of this application came from Donald Thompson, 24 Call, saying it would be particularly valuable that some of these services should run through Call, Vatisker and Breivik. And uh, this is another one. Kenneth MacDonald, an employee of the gas company, said it was very hard on him to wait on Wednesdays and Fridays from 5 o'clock until 6.10 to get the bus home. The commissioners were in favour of the improved services and if this was the case, the application would be approved. They were also aware that Mr Mitchell's claims should not be overlooked, although he hadn't applied for any increase in his services. So that is, that, that's Mitchell's services in 1943. So it, you can see it takes um, from 11.20 till 5 past 12 to get from Stornoway to Tolsta. I think it's quicker, quicker today, is it? Not a lot. Anyway, it wasn't long before there was another run-in with John Mitchell. In 1948, John Murray, in his position as Secretary of the Back Transport Limited, was in court charged with running a contract bus. Now, that's a bus that's uh, not a regular service, it's just a special hire. So the Gazette reported this as follows. Kenneth MacLeod, 50 back, stated that because of dissatisfaction with the service run by Mr Mitchell, he and his fellow workers in the mills from the district of Back got together and decided to place a contract for a nightly service running from McDonald's Mill to Back at 6pm. This took passengers close to their homes instead of letting them off at the road end and having to walk a distance of over a mile, which was what Mitchell's buses did. Uh, there was no need for them to walk into town, so they got home earlier. There were 23 people travelling by that bus. And uh, he said that um, before, when they went on Mitchell's bus, uh, when back passengers went into Mitchell's bus, the conductress asked them to stand to make room for the Tolsta passengers. <laughs> Why did they get special treatment? John Mitchell argued back, said there's now three buses going in that direction at 6.10, one to Tongue, one to Back, one to Tolsta, and he had his licences varied so he could now go to the road ends and he would provide the same service. The Back Stornoway transport bus left just a few minutes before his and he complained that because of this he was losing passengers. Sheriff Mitchell found the charge proven, said the run was taking place too frequently to be considered a special hire. If it occurred once a month, it would be OK, but because it was each night, it wasn't going to be uh, accepted. So, only three months later, they were at it again. The first mention referred to there at this time was the deplorable state of the North Tolster Road. Mitchell stated the state of the road was disgraceful at any time in the 20th century. Uh, and there was also a claim from John Macmillan of North Tolster, who wanted a reduction in his fares for the workers. Apparently they had to pay extra for travelling on the bad road between Gress and Tolster. There was a, a strange situation that 
uh, workers' fares were available as far as Gress, but beyond that you had to pay the full fare. Don't ask how that came about. There was also a complaint on Saturdays. When work finished at noon, there wasn't a bus till four o'clock. This meant the whole day was lost, and uh, the complainer stated he had to pay four shillings return fare for only four hours' work. And this was the occasion when John Mitchell was asked whether he knew of any other bus operator in the United Kingdom who spent the same amount as he did on the upkeep of vehicle springs, saying, I don't think any others exist. Uh, now, Neil Stewart and the Gress Grazings Committee clerk, he appeared on behalf of Gress parents. He asked if Mitchell's timetable could be adjusted so that children could get to school by bus. Apparently there was one which took the younger ones for 10 o'clock, but the older ones who started at 9.30 had to walk. It was claimed that in winter this was a great hardship and it affected their schooling. And then the next complaint about overcrowding. Provis Mitchell, I don't think it was a relation, said that the previous night the 11 o'clock bus from store on the way to back had been greatly overcrowded with at least 20 passengers standing. They were packed close together and you couldn't get the door closed. And the most serious, dangerous the most serious and dangerous feature was the fact that several girl passengers were standing on the step of the bus. The reply was the incident was exceptional. There were a number of girls from the district leaving that night on the boat and there had been a bit of a do seeing them off. And there was a football match that people had stayed in town for. An undertaking would be given that in similar circumstances a duplicate bus would be provided. Now, uh, here we are, the Tolster Road was clearly no better when the traffic commissioners met again in 1949. Is there another picture to come up? We're bored looking at that one. There we are. This was a, a statement that they made that um, proposals for, for an extra bus in the evening. And uh, Kenneth MacLeod of Back said, Back was an enlightened community. <laughs> so there we are. Um, yes, the Tolster Road. Damage being done to buses, one suggestion was to extend the running times by 10 or 15 minutes to enable the drivers to drive with some degree of caution, saving wear and tear on the buses. John Mitchell thought the only solution was to do something to the roads, otherwise there would be no buses available for anyone in a short time. This was the, the next proposal then, that back Stornoway was going to uh, provide these services. The 7.15 would be good for those working overtime. The 10 p.m. from back was useful, often men working late repairing buses at the garage and back and wanted to get, uh, sometimes had to hire a car rather than take a bus. The commissioner added at this point he was glad someone was repairing the buses. Uh, I'm just trying to, type to, to uh, edit this down a little bit at this point. Anyway, we come to later on in this meeting where a bit of common sense was talked about and the two parties agreed it would have been sensible if they had consulted together to see how they could best serve the district. Mr Murray of Backstore, in a way, said he thought it was futile to try and discuss their applications beforehand. John Mitchell argued the 7.15 was unnecessary. The mailboat bus, which he presumably ran, was always practically empty. Mr Murray responded, the mailboat bus is a dead loss and always will be. Nobody recognises the mailboat bus as a bus service. So by 1950, things were not looking too bright. The commissioner said, I would advise curtailment of services. John Mitchell stated, the time is not far off. We will not be able to keep buses on the roads. And these words were indeed prophetic. For in June 1951, John Mitchell acquired the business of the Back Stornoway Transport Limited. And this was the end of competition on the back and Tolster routes. So the four buses passed into John Mitchell's ownership 
all with a few years life left in them despite the battering they had taken. So there we have Tom Laddie, Morag Allen, Futter and I have written here unknown. I don't know whether anybody can shed any light on that one. And there we have Margaret Ann Chorus of Vienich, Seanage Uliam Ian and Mardina Roll Hallan. And this very tatty photograph, uh, that bus was still running in 1954, but it might even have been running in the 1960s as well. John Stewart and Chrissy McLeod are the two in the picture there. So for the next 28 years, the people of Back got used to Mitchell's buses. To begin with, they'd have been going on buses like that. And then they're getting slightly, I think that's a lovely picture of what must have been late 1950s. And then we got the familiar blue buses uh, coming in the 1960s. That's another wonderful picture there with the, the Callanish Circle and the plaster field and the back buses and masses of people all cramming their way onto them. And there's one presumably reached its destination. The number of people that I have heard say to me, these buses had wooden seats in them. Well, as far as I can see from these photographs, it was only the back seats that were wooden. Uh, so my assumption is that everybody was trying to get to the back seats all the time. <laughs> anyway, that's the inside. It's uh, quite primitive looking. And there's winter time. That's a wonderful photograph. Uh, apparently after that happened, that was when the buses stopped going round that way and then they continued along Cromwell Street and, and to the stop where they stopped today. Can anybody remember the date that one? Yeah. What? Can anybody remember that, the date that that happened? I remember the date that happened. Yeah, I remember the date. It was one of the weeks. Was it? Mm -hmm. Round with the ice. Was there a councillor on the bus or did she just, I can't remember. How they stopped just there, it's... Uh, That's the way the buses were coming around, wasn't it? Yeah. They would come round that way and along. They weren't supposed to do a shortcut. They were supposed to go around the corner. Yeah. Yeah. Stop at the... Stop at the... But there was nobody in board. It was just a dead one going into the back of the station. There was no passing. Can I, I, I'm confused as to where the, this picture is. Yeah, just past the church. Yeah, just past the church. This side of the church, isn't it? Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the road going up to the, the school there. That's, that's the school. All right, uh-huh. Yep. And that is Murdican MacDonald. And that's the timetable that was on the go in the 1960s. So plenty of buses. Uh, not so many newsworthy events. In 1963 Ian Mitchell offered to sell his bus company to David McBrain. Uh, after looking at the books and the state of the buses, uh, looking at that one, it's not surprising that he declined the offer. In the year ending 31st March 1962, the buses covered between Stornoway and back a distance of 90,986 miles, earning a revenue of just over £8,000. So it wasn't exactly a profitable business. In 1979, there were no buses for a week and the drivers had gone on strike. The men were complaining they were getting 56 pence a week less than they should have done. And the strike was successful. In those days the buses still had clippies, conductresses. Uh, I don't know who these two are. Somebody might know. And 
this, I think, just think this is an absolutely wonderful picture. Uh, she never actually operated on the buses coming down here, but it, it's, uh, to me, it's, it's so redolent of the time. Uh, she said uh, to me that, that, I mean, she's got the ticket machine, she's got the money bag, she's got the stilettos, it's just before miniskirts. Uh, her comment was, I don't know how I ever managed to get up and down the bus dressed like that. <laughs> So eventually the Clippies went and it was a one-man operation. And then the next stage was that John, uh, Ian Mitchell decided that's it, he's had enough, he's fallen out with the council. And this was about just a few weeks beforehand appeared in the Gazette that all the bus services were going to uh, come to an end. Uh, there's one or two th things that appeared in the paper. I could have mentioned the following incident. A dispute between a bus driver and a lorry driver held up the mailboat for half an hour. The two vehicles met on a single track road and the bus was going to meet the mailboat. There was a passing place 80 yards behind the bus and 15 yards behind the lorry. Both drivers shouted to the other to reverse but neither would move. The standoff lasted for 15 to 20 minutes and then the lorry driver reversed to the passing place but stayed in the middle of the road. <laughs> the bus still could not pass. Finally, after another 10 minutes, the lorry driver finally grudgingly allowed just enough room for the bus to continue on its way. But it didn't happen on the road to back, so I'm not going to tell you that story. <laughs> another one I could have mentioned about the tinker who threw two stones at a Mitchell's bus. Piercing the side of the bus, causing damage to the value of three pounds. He was taken to court and pled guilty. He said, someone hit him and threw him off a bus while it was moving. It was raining and Mitchell's bus following did not stop. <laughs> he explained, I had not got my senses at the time. <laughs> the sheriff asked if he had his senses at any time, <laughs> to which he replied, a little. <laughs> he was fined six pounds, but that wasn't the back service either, so I'm not going to tell you that story. Anyway, here we are, the uh, withdrawal of the services, and the drivers were not happy either, so they went and barricaded the council buildings. However, it didn't help at all, and uh, there was going to be no buses. There was panic throughout the island. Of course, that didn't happen, and other operators were found to step in. In the case of the back service, it was William MacDonald, William Handy, He'd already been operating the school service using this bus, which he told me was always known as the Wee Red Bus. Um, and there was also this wonderful picture. Some of you might recognize. <laughs> this was the occasion when they discovered Andy Gray was home visiting, so he stopped the bus and everybody got off the bus to uh, get autographs and, and presumably just touch him or whatever they do. <laughs> so uh, the McDonald's operated pretty much of the same timetable as before and he took over some of the Mitchell's buses but he decided he would paint them in his own colours. So we have this red and blue scheme. And there's another one at the proper bus stop in town. That bus apparently was bought by uh, Ian Mitchell when the Arnish uh, was in full swing and he bought two buses like that uh, to take workers out to Arnish and back. And there's a back bus at the bus station. He also operated the service from Allapool to Inverness for a while. That was in the good old days when you could put your cases into a van at, the, at Stornoway and you could get them out again at Inverness and it was a wonderful service and it, it's a shame eventually that came to an end as well. He also at one point must have had coaches running to, uh, to Glasgow as well. So in 1996 he retired from running the buses and the service was then taken over by Lochs Motor Transport. You might recognise that gentleman. Mm -hmm. 
And then we come up to the more recent times when the council won the contract in 1999. So this was... Uh, they had these Mercedes buses, small ones, on the run for quite a while. They were good because you could have a lovely chat with the driver. Um, that which was very, 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 still very, very important. And occasionally they would put on one of these buses and you could sit up high. It was great because you could look down into everybody's window and gardens as you were going past. And then, I can't remember exactly when it was, but they introduced the first of the low floor buses which was this great long thing that I remember seeing it winding its way around Gary Hurum and thinking it's never going to get round there um, and then this is what we have got today and they're not so good for having a chat with the driver at all now I'm going to finish off with three uh, little pieces that I think sum up the, the whole story of the, the bus service to back. The first one dates from 1926 and it's entitled The Fishwives of Back. The Sharabank is ubiquitous. It has penetrated to every village in rural Lewis, greatly to the benefit of the dwellers therein. But if any portion of the community has special reason to hail its advent, surely it is that group of women who, when the broad bay yields up its bounty, proceed to town to dispense of their fish. To people even casually in touch with this locality, it was quite a familiar but nonetheless harrowing sight to see the fishwives bowed under the weight of the creels, trudging wearily to Stornoway, a distance of seven miles, to supply the townsfolk with their fresh haddock. <coughs> the enterprising motor hirer has changed all that, transforming what was a work of drudgery into quite a pleasurable event in the lives of the women. This is what happens now. The Sharabanks, on arrival of the boats, proceed as near the beach as the principle of safety first will permit. Wait till the haddocks are sheared out, take in their complement of women and creels, and run them into town in less than half an hour. Once there, the business is transacted as of yore, the little bit of gossip is enjoyed, the news is garnered from far and near, and the bus is waiting. Home before noon, the women are ready to tackle the next job in hand having combined business and pleasure with the minimum of fatigue. Surely a most welcome and much needed reform. We're coming up to the 1950s. This is a report of a court case. There was a bus many years ago, no horn, screen wiper, speedometer, fire extinguisher or efficient handbrake. The court dealt with the owner, but that was only the beginning of the vehicle's fame. What the bus lacked in apparatus, which every Lewis man will tell you is just unnecessary and confusing, is more than balanced by the vivacity of the conversation and the good yarns which were told in both English and Gaelic on the last run of the evening from Stornoway to Tolsta. The Lewis bus is no insensate mass of mechanism. It has character and feeling for the island roads. And like the old van man's horse, it knows itself the road ends where it is expected to stop. In our experience, the driver seldom took much to do with the direction of the bus. It did very well on its own, and it left him free to sit with his head to turned towards the passengers, with whom he passed the time in bilingual banter and the leading of an occasional chorus of Ho Ro My Nut Brown Maiden. Taking the charges in order, they are obviously irrelevant. No vehicle emitting the sounds that come from the passengers and moving the parts of a Lewis bus has any need of a horn. A windscreen wiper is a luxury when the driver does not look through the windscreen. And what would they be doing with a speedometer when everybody knows that the bus has only one speed, flat out, and it takes an hour from Stornoway to North Tolsta? That nothing could take fire and remain burning in Lewis weather is too ridiculous to contemplate. Of what use is a handbrake when the driver is using both hands to illustrate the point of a good story? Finally, there is no point in exhibiting a license when everybody knows not only who owns the bus, but what his great-grandfather's nickname was and when he is hoping to get another second-hand tyre for the off-front wheel, which has been giving trouble ever since it took away a milestone near Gress. <laughs> and the final one. This was a lady who wrote about a journey she'd made from back to Stornoway. On the night before the departure, she was advised to book with the driver, who promised that the bus would leave 
between 10 and 11. <laughs> Although the house was a good mile from the normal bus route, he promised to call for her, which he did at five past 11. When the bus stopped to collect a couple of boys, the old woman who was seeing them off shook hands with everyone in the bus. At the hospital outside Stornoway, the bus stopped again and waited 15 minutes while a woman paid a visit to her sick husband. On the return journey, the bus again stopped at the hospital and waited while the wife presented her husband with the cake she had bought for him in the town. When a visitor among the passengers saw a good subject for, the, for her camera, the bus driver obligingly pulled up to let her take a snap of the shielding and even suggested she should go to the top of the hill where she would find a much nicer house. <laughs> but alas, timetables and traffic commissioners have largely destroyed our individuality and the Lewis bus is now merely an efficient mode of transport. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, indeed, Colin. Uh, uh, as Colin was saying, he is still looking for information and he's quite, he's, he's quite fast to get information about that and that he has to the buses. A couple of things that came up, I, I thought to myself, when you're mentioning the buses and the lorries. I like John Mulgolly, out uh, called uh, Isle of Survivor. Uh, he, he, used to, he used to actually manufacture bodies for buses. Alright? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, so, so there were some people who had, had capital skills who used to, to manufacture the bodies that they put in the back of the, or, or, or the, or the vehicles yeah. that, that came to them. Uh, uh, another, uh, another thing that, on the other end of it was I was actually a young councillor on the council when Mitchell uh, uh, stopped the buses. Nobody believed that he was doing it and was actually doing an argument about that he, he felt he wasn't getting enough of a subsidy. But they weren't relying on the, set, on, on the income from fares, they were relying on the subsidy they got from the council. Just a couple of things in the passing myself. Now, what about, is there anything else, anybody else has that I could add to, uh, to, to or help Colin in any of the things he had? Miles Granson, Joyce Granson here, uh, I'm going to go back to the oldies of the company. Is there anything else really? Yeah, I'd like to think that I'm not the oldest person here, though, and I don't know why that problem. I probably am. But just the names of the drivers, I remember a guy who was driving for visiting the company, Bill Davis. Oh, yeah. who subsequently became the greenkeeper steward at the golf club. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, also saw, I also saw one of the people in the company, and I didn't know that until I saw the photo, George Freer. George Freer. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I had no idea that they actually lived, lived here at all, that was in the, in the rest of the home. Yeah. And as for dangerous places with buses, it's not directly way to back, but what was the till bus before it started going to plastic? It used to leave from outside my gilderies. That's where the, what is it, the whiskey shop or something is, mm -hmm. uh, in Granite Buildings. A 42-seater Alpine bus, you know where it went? Up Church Street. <laughs> and came back down the same way. What about any other questions that you want to ask people that they have had to come up and answers for color? Not really, so a, a, a more re very recent story that um, I, I like, because it shows that the, the whole thing is, is still going on the whole property. There were two visitors came off a cruise ship, and they, uh, they didn't want to go on a tour, they just wanted to go on a, on a somewhere on a service bus. And it was Anna who, who suggested that they could get a bus half an hour down to back and into town again. They wouldn't get off. And you met them in the afternoon and, and you asked how they got on and they said it was absolutely wonderful. And they said, the driver told us about everything. <laughs> told us all the beaches and the, the names of the places. And then they said, and we discovered that we had the same kind of tractor. <laughs> and not only that then, they said, and he took us up to his house to show us the tractor. <laughs> and that was only, what, a few years ago now, so and, and, and yeah, I shouldn't be saying these things, I'll be in trouble. But just two days ago, uh, I was the only one on the bus, so he shouldn't have gone into Upper Call, but because it was raining, he said, I'll just take you in there. <laughs> Where else was this? <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know who that person was, but he and the was well known for, uh, okay. if he didn't know the uh, uh, information, would certainly give them the information. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I know that we don't have to do with the, 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 the whale, whale bone and, and, and black and this kind of thing. But the, the thing is, when I hear it talk about the, the drivers, you know, uh -huh. after what again left, yeah. who, who are the other drivers that people can't remember from, from the old days? Nearly two. Nearly two, uh huh. Really? Yeah. Who do you think? I mean, who do you guess? I'm not sure. Who? Yeah, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 Yes, George, and, and also in uh, Harvard's Nederland. Uh, oh, yes, Marina. And also in the Shemili Sample for a while. Nien Geiler was for a while. Jan Spelman. Oh, yes. Jan Spelman. 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 What? I was in the Morocco school. Ah, ah, ah. I've seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is good to get a little bit of these things, but it is much more than here than I could. Anyway, it's a start of a good conversation. And I'm going to ask Gambis now to maybe say a word or two. Thank you. 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 Oh, is that what you do? Uh, so, but because uh, even after the four and third time here, when we look at the, the locals around the book and the new units. However, today I was over in Harris and I met up with Bill Ross and I saw him actually over at a funeral. And it proved to be yet again that in clusters or in commercial or bike sectors or whatever it was called, call it, in the, in the mm -hmm. area can be incredibly important when it comes to the retention of uh, local history and knowledge. Bill has just published his 100th book about the, the history of the, the Highlands and Islands and the Western Islands, as you say, and he's going to leave a tremendous legacy. Colm hasn't quite got to his 100th yet, but he's been writing about transportation in Scarpe, the, the Cunninghams about rituals, and now we've got this very uh, interesting presentation about the buses of back. Um, it's a great piece of research done with his usual diligence, enthusiasm, attention and detail, and I think even more importantly, a uh, sense of humour. That's what brings it all to life, after all. And he's uh, digging into all these family relationships that, you know, it was quite difficult for somebody from the from with the district, but does it with real uh, skill. So I hope others, once we get the, the building up and operation here in the in the area, we will build on that legacy that this is just the start of it and that it will generate more and more interest in a range of topics such as this back. Um, uh, the topic of buses is very, very dear to my own heart. I learned to drive on a 19 uh, seater Bedford LTD 795C and printed in my brain forever and ever on then. Uh, we had one of the Mitchell buses, exactly as you saw there, my father bought it off Mitchell. Uh, we've run that for, for a few years. And uh, one of my favourite stories about buses is an old bus that we used to have on the school run called Donfush from, from Tarver. And he never ever changed the destination. It was always old, it didn't matter where he was. <laughs> <laughs> and this kind of put us very one night and said, uh, a single tour, please. And he says, oh, I'm, I'm a good, I'm sorry, you look at I'm going to storm it. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, well, it says, hold on the front of your bus. Well, it looks like it says, India on the four tires, and I'm not going to. The other thing we really, really appreciated was when my father ran the Harris football club bus for about 20 years. Saturday morning was a real good send. All these people that had come into the, the Harris bus, coins, fags, yeah. Uh, and other things that I won't mention. <laughs> Journey of discovery to volunteer to clean the bus on a Saturday morning. <laughs> and myself and my two brothers used to fight over the privilege yeah. of cleaning up this. So, as I say, uh, a great topic to learn with uh, real eloquence. And thanks very much indeed.